That was your foot. You can sing. You definitely don't want me to sing. Singing the event for the BCATW in um, my two years of being a member. Um, this is the most expansive, uh, longest, uh, and uh, best attended uh, event we've had. And um, I just want to say it's all because of Lo Lauren Mowry. Yeah. It's all because of her. Yeah. Yes. And I'll tell you why. Um, I met Lauren last year at the Wine Bloggers Conference in Penticton, and um, she, of course, won the uh, award for best new blog, wine blog, um, for her blog, Chasing the Vine. And uh, since then, we kept in touch on Facebook. And um, at one point, we were, you know, Facebooking uh, instant messaging. Uh, about WordPress, and she said, oh yeah, I'm going to come out to BC in May. And I said, really? Why, why don't you come and speak at our symposium, which is going to be scheduled for April or May. So, um, so I put it to the committee, and everyone just jumped on it. It was a tremendous meeting we had. We are just full of ideas how we can create a whole food and wine thing around Lauren's speech, and so um, it just snowballed until it is what you see today. And um, so I want to thank Lauren. <laughs> thank you for your inspiration leading to this uh, Taste of Travel symposium today. Lauren lives in New York City, and she graduated from law school at Fordham, right? Yep. And uh, she became a practicing litigator. Oh, <laughs> what a surprise. Uh, somewhere along the way, she, maybe she'll tell us how she got into wine and writing and travel writing. Um, and also, I should note that she's about to sit for her level four WSET exam next month. That's, uh, it, you guys know what that is. And of course, we wish her the best of luck. Um, if you follow... Can you explain what that is? Oh, WSET is a, uh, is a, is a, a standardization uh, educational program uh, for sommeliers? She'll, ex she'll explain it in a moment, okay? Um, it's not on my notes, so I don't know. <laughs> Um, if you follow Lauren on Facebook, you would know in the last five months she's traveled to New Zealand, Fiji, Argentina, Peru, and Washington State. And now she's traveling around our fair province of British Columbia, snooping out stories. Um, she writes for Wine and Spirits, Wine Enthusiasts, Savour, uh, Men's Journal, as well as Fodors.com. And she writes a coffee and tea column for the Village Voice, among other publications. So I think it's pretty clear that Lauren Mowry knows how to eat and drink her way around the world. So she's here to tell us how she does it. So here she is, Lauren Mowry. Well, I hope my speech can live up to that introduction, but uh, thank you guys. I'm happy to be here, happy to be back here a year later. 
as Mary mentioned, uh, last year was sort of a, a big point and the, the life of my blog, winning the best new wine blog of the year award, that's actually what brought me back here. But I'll get into that a little bit later, as well as the W set. Um, before I start though, I was hoping to get to know you guys a little bit since I really don't know 97% of the faces in here. And uh, I assume we're all here because we have the travel bug, is that correct? <laughs> um, I was bit really early on, but uh, I was also curious what people's range of writing experiences are. And maybe if with a show of hands, if you don't mind your neighbors knowing, um, I was curious what the time range that people have been writing is for. So has anybody been in the business, say, under five years? Okay, five to 10 years? Anyone over 10? So why aren't you guys giving this presentation? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it looks like we have a range of experiences in here, and hopefully, uh, I'm not up here as an expert, just to share what, what's happened to me and my story, and hopefully you'll glean something from it, relate to some of the things I've gone through. And you know, what's great about these kinds of symposiums is that everybody brings something to the table, and you learn a little bit something that you didn't know, and hopefully I can give you something back. So. Um, as Mary mentioned, I'm a New York City-based writer. I cover wine, uh, drink, which includes tea and coffee, and uh, I actually write for the Village Voice. I have some, just some slides up here. She mentioned most of these already, but I have a coffee and tea blog for the Voice. My blog is Chasing the Vine, which won last year, um, and then Voters, Wine Merchant, a number of other publications. I'm constantly building my repertoire. Uh, I think every month I've added another one or two different outlets, which has been fantastic. Um, so, I'd like to start with beer, and, <laughs> and uh, I assume many of you have maybe heard this quote before, but it takes a lot of good beer to make good wine. <laughs> if you talk to any winemaker worldwide, especially around harvest time, when their hours are long, their backs are sore, and they've been tasting grapes all day and fermenting juice, the last thing they really want at the end of the day is a glass of wine. Most of them reach for beer. So I often find where there's a good wine culture, you'll find a vibrant beer culture. Sonoma, California, Wellington, New Zealand, Portland, Oregon, and right here in Vancouver, in British Columbia. Over the last week, I've been out visiting wineries at the Similkameen, Okanagan, uh, Vancouver Island. I was out there for three days, and I discovered along the way this thriving beer culture of the province, which is really exciting. I plan to spend tomorrow digging into it. So. Um, I actually met with Joe Weeb, the author of Craft Beer Revolution, a guide to the BC breweries, and he gave me a lot of insights and tips on where to spend my day tomorrow. So, <laughs> happy Sunday. Looking forward to it. <laughs> um, but while it takes a lot of good beer to make good wine, I've also found it takes a lot of good coffee and tea during the day to write a good story. Yeah. Because you can't drink wine all day. Mm. I've tried, the stories don't come out very good. <laughs> so, I view the world primarily through the lens of drink and how it reflects the local culture, food, and lifestyle of a place and people. This is my writing companion, by the way. <laughs> if you are a writer, which uh, I assume many of you do, probably it's many hours of the day, you notice that there's a lot of lonely hours during that day. Yes. Do you when you work from home like I do? So my dog keeps me company, he makes me get out of my seat. And if you want to contact me after the event today, have any questions, there's my email up on the screen. My uh, Twitter handle is at Chasing the Vine, and I recommend if there's anything of interest that I say to you today, feel free to hashtag it. If there's anything you don't like, email me privately. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll explain this eye chart that most of you probably can't see. Uh, last year, when wine sites were ranked by their influence in the U.S. market, to nobody's surprise, Wine Searcher and Wine Spectator were at the very top up there. But I was actually quite surprised to find that my personal blog showed up at the bottom and that's me right at the very tippity bottom, <laughs> pulling up the rear in the web index. So I want to cover a couple topics today and also be cognizant of the time. Uh, I want to talk about the value of blogging. I'm not sure how many people in here blog uh, or are trying to or, um, or want to improve what they're doing. Uh, how I choose my subjects and uh, we may cover a little bit of how to write tasting notes on wine and some other things, so let's get started. How did I get here? I was born in Ohio. I was not exactly a food and wine mecca for any of you who are familiar with the state. 
Although you'd be surprised, which I was while studying for my WSET exam, to find that it's actually a very large viticultural region. Unfortunately, it's producing mostly jug quality wine. So you can see why I left. However, my grandmother was a travel agent and she lived right outside of New York City. So growing up during the holidays, I would go and spend five or six days with her while she'd work. I'd sit on the floor of her travel agency, pulling down to her chagrin, all of those glossy brochures, and I'd sit, in, sit on the walls, dreaming of all the fabulous places we go one day. And my first obsession was actually Egypt. Uh, I think I was fascinated by how on earth those pyramids were built, and I think, I think we know to this day, in fact. And so she allowed me to plan the first trip of my, life, of my travel history, and it was to Egypt. We went to the Nile, visited the pyramids. Um, I was hooked after that, and I never looked back. I also took my first photography class in high school and got my first camera. I took on that trip, and I also still have some of the photos from that trip, which uh, continue to propel me through photography and inspire me through writing. So after high school, I moved on to college in Charlottesville, UVA. I was at, uh, I was basically in a winemaking community that was founded by Thomas Jefferson. Although Thomas Jefferson, after 30 years of experimenting with wine production, never actually made a drinkable bottle of wine, <laughs> is considered the founder of wine production in Virginia. So maybe in the whole country, one could say. Uh, although people in California would argue with that, but we won't go into that. In Virginia, I tasted my first Viognier. It was actually at a winery called Jefferson Vineyards. How apropos. It was a this peachy delight. It was alive. It was bigger, invigorating, and it opened my eyes and, and palate to the possibilities of what wine could be. So I started reading about it. I, got it. I was the only one I think I knew in college that had a wine spectator subscription. I studied the producers, the regions, memorized vintages of wines I'd never tasted in places I'd never been, but hoped that one day I would. After college, I moved to NYC, and of course was in a very small apartment. I still am in a very small apartment. Uh, my roommate at the time had to live in the living room that was converted to a bedroom. And when I arrived, I couldn't figure out how to live in New York and learn photography, work in journalism, and not end up homeless. So I went to law school. Three years later, I was an insurance litigator, which is a soul-crushing profession. <laughs> All I could think about was how to get out of that decision that I had made. So I worked, I paid off my loans, and continued to dream about how to stop practicing law. I wasn't doing what I wanted to do, so all of my money, resources, and time was spent towards traveling. I was going down to Mendoza, went to Croatia, um, and also buying wines to try to improve my palate. And I also started taking courses at the WSET, which is a, the Wine and Spirits uh, Education Trust. It's the most well-recognized wine education program in the world. It's based in London, and it's the, essentially the precursor to taking the MW exam. So I'm considering taking the MW, assuming I pass in June. Uh, I need to start studying on Monday as soon as I get home. <laughs> but uh, other folks who are considering taking the MS, there's a whole program. Oftentimes people will overlap and take the WSET and, the, and then also go on to the MS, but you don't have to. It's not a service-oriented program. I, I think you, I'm looking at you because I believe you asked earlier. Or someone over in this direction? <laughs> anyway, so hopefully that explains. So I finally did leave law to look for a wine career. My first entry into the wine world was at guilt.com. I'm not sure if you all have that up here. Um, it's an online startup fashion retailer, and they were moving into the food and wine world to compete with another online flash site that had just moved into the wine world called Lot 18. My friend's boss ran the group, but he didn't know the difference between a variety and a vintage, and I don't think that he cared. So he brought me on to help build that program from scratch. I spent a year with him, well, he didn't really do the taste the wines, but I did. Blind tasting wines, traveling to procure wines, writing tasting notes, pairing the wines with the food offerings. Unfortunately, eventually the group was disbanded. They, the owners of the company felt women's retail was more lucrative than the wine and food business, considering all the laws that we deal with, and I know you have in Canada as well. So um, I left Guilt, and I was convinced I wanted to work in wine and travel journalism. I just wasn't sure where at that point. So while I was looking for opportunities, I decided to start my blog, and I named it Chasing the Vine. 
While I was writing this blog, uh, I connected with a former colleague of mine from Guilt. She had been offered the position of head food critic at the Village Voice, and she and I stayed in touch for uh, a couple months. So I had arranged to meet with her and just had been thinking, you know, they don't have a weekly wine column. So, you know, a lot of people do now, the New York Times does. Maybe they should. I pitched it to her, and then surprisingly, they agreed. So I titled the column Unscrewed, as in screw cap bottle, rather than uncorked, because, or cork, you know, rather than the cork closure, and a lot of the name uncorked has been used in a lot of, uh, a lot of sites anyway. But the idea was to bring something new to the conversation of wine, hence Unscrewed. It represents topics I want to talk about, new developments in the wine world, new places in the wine world, or unusual grapes, and it served as a counter to the old guard in wine writing much of which focuses on Burgundy, Bordeaux, and scores. So I just want to touch on the value of blogging. Why I think it's worth doing. You're not getting paid, obviously. Uh, it, and it takes a lot of time and effort. And who knows who is reading your work. <clears throat> For those of you who don't write a blog, but are interested in becoming a food and wine or travel writer, or expanding into another topic you don't have expertise in, it's a great vehicle to establish that presence, gain credibility, and build a portfolio of writing and photography. It demonstrates your commitment to the field also, and provides an outlet for a great story tip, a great story or tip or photos that you don't know where, to sh where else to share. Um, I, I try to post at least once a week. Uh, I know a lot of people are much more prolific than that. I find I can't talk to my husband, uh, do my other work or walk the dog if I try to actually do more than once or twice a week posting on a blog because it's very time consuming. But it's very rewarding in the end and we'll get to that shortly. <coughs> Ways to make it interesting. Pick a topic you care about and it doesn't have to be a topic that anybody necessarily, it doesn't have to be a topic you think people want to read about. It has to be something you're passionate about. And you don't need extensive knowledge either. You can use that blog as a tool to self-educate and finding a niche is easier than covering everything under the category. For instance, I don't include a lot of tasting notes on wines on my blog, even though I write them and I write about wine. It would just become too much. Um, I also think interviewing is a great way to add value to your blog, but I'll expand on that in a later section. I would also suggest to write as if you're writing an article for a publication. Always make sure you have edited it thoroughly. There are a lot of bloggers out there who have not read what they've posted. <laughs> and it's sometimes the information's wrong, the grammar is incorrect, um, there's a whole host of things. So if you are really looking to propel your career with this, definitely make sure you edit edited your work. And what I'm about to say, I regularly break this rule, but I'll say it anyway, because that's what everyone says you should do, is opt for a short, well-written post over a lengthy dissertation. I tend towards a dissertation, <laughs> but people say you don't catch the attention span of your readers that way. Um, I was going to touch on photos, but it looks like we have a very well-rounded crowd in here as far as photography. I think everyone brought their camera to put me. <laughs> I was thinking, I take a break from carrying it around today because I have that very heavy DSLR and those very heavy lenses. So, um, but I'm sure you know by now, always use photos and choose your best, if possible, invested software. And I know that was touched on earlier, but uh, I personally work with Lightroom. It's easy and you can improve photos vastly and salvage, salvage images you thought maybe you wouldn't be able to use. I also shoot in RAW, so that makes a big difference in the quality of your work. Um, and then I think that this is a key point. Take creative shots, which was also addressed this morning, so I won't spend too much time on it. But I, if you just look to the screen for a couple examples, because I write about wine, shooting bottle photos is the most boring subject imaginable. And I see a lot of people treat it that way on their blogs or in their articles. It's just a bunch of bottles. So I will literally take my bottles to the streets and come up with interesting streetscapes or places to position them just to give it a little more interest. So these are some vermouth bottles I put on a, a manhole in New York City. I got on my stomach and lit a, a very dirty sidewalk, mind you, to take that photo, and everyone thought I was nuts walking by me. Um, I found this basket on a bike on the street, just threw some bottles in, took the shot. That uh, upper right bottle is Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt's Rosé, which I was reviewing for an article. So. Yeah. <laughs> it actually was good. <laughs> I'm not sure I wanted to like it, but, <laughs> but you know, 
That was good. And it doesn't matter. Twenty two dollars, you know, of rosé. They can go up to fifty. So at least from Provence. Um, the other bottle was just above a swimming pool because I liked how the light was reflecting on it. Uh, the bottles on the top left are just some rosé bottles that we took to the beach and then shot in the sand and then immediately drank. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a fun shoot. <laughs> and uh, I'll just mention one other one, the one on the top right. I was doing an article on uh, sherry cocktails and white port cocktails. So I went down to another public space. I brought the mixers, I brought the garnish and the glasses. And I mixed it up right there, looking around to make sure I wasn't going to get caught by the police. And put the cocktails there, did the shot, and again we drank the we drank the uh, the evidence. The evidence. <laughs> <laughs> Those the artificial um, ice cubes. Those are real, Those are and they were melting. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see the one on the left actually is not as a, not as pretty as the one on the right. So, anyway, moving moving on. Uh, so I think there are a lot of opportunities that have arisen from writing this blog and first off was just being awarded Best New Wine blog last year. I also was nominated for Best Original Photography, although that went to Jordan Winery, but I'm hoping to take that away from her this year, we'll see. Um, but uh, by winning that award, that brought me back to British Columbia this year, so here I am standing in front of Bellevue Books, so just from putting time and energy into writing a blog. My blog was also discovered by a Finnish magazine called Etiketti, yeah. and uh, it's actually the uh, alcohol, alcohol, I don't speak Finnish, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, um, distributes this magazine throughout Finland and in Denmark. And uh, they printed to the far right, you'll see I'm at the bottom with my photo and a blurb about me and a link to my blog. So that was distributed throughout those two countries. I still don't know what it says, actually. <laughs> I suppose I could have Google translated, but <laughs> I am just assuming it's nice. <laughs> Maybe I didn't want to know. I don't know. Um, but also having a blog helped me get the gig at the Village Voice. So I was really surprised after writing for the Village Voice after three months that I received an email from a PR company in New York. Now, I don't know how PR is out here, but it's a very big machine in Manhattan. So where I live, I have access to a lot of those firms, and they're always hunting for new writers and new experiences and opportunities to provide them. The email said, we are offering you an all-expense paid trip to Trentino, Italy, on behalf of the Ferrari family. <laughs> <laughs> Not realizing at the time, they didn't mean the Ferraris and car family. It was Ferrari sparkling wine family, who are equally as important, by the way. And apparently, they are friends, the two families. But uh, it was for a sparkling wine camp. And there was a group of eight sommeliers, and I was the one journalist. So we spent a week learning how to blend base wine. They're actually aging our base wine right now. And in three years, they'll bottle it and send a case of it to each of us that participated in the inaugural sparkling wine oh, camp. Cool. Wow. Wow. While we were there, we were treated to a day in Venice, and an overnight in Verona, and a helicopter ride above the Dolomites. I really thought I oh, had hit the, hit the jackpot. This is, is this what happens when you blog about wine? I did. <laughs> Um, why am I telling you this? Just to brag, really, actually. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> now, I just wanted to make the point that by starting a blog, or whatever it is that you're committed to doing, you can gain access to a lot of really fantastic opportunities. Um, just a couple of points I picked up from writing in the last couple years. I know you all have a range of experience, some with print, online or both. Uh, some of you are getting started and others are tweaking your career to adjust to the new media model, um, which has tended to go online, pay less money, employ more people who don't know what they're doing. Uh, so it's a, it's a tough world. And as I said, I'm not an expert, but I'll just share what some of the tips I've found over the last few years. Uh, my writing journey is still in its infancy, but I have had some successes. So uh, my first point would be to find an online publication to contribute to regularly. If you can become their expert, that's even better in the vein of what I did with the Village Voice. Um, print nowadays, as I mentioned, is nearly impossible. Although I did discover this this week, the BC Craft Beer News. And Kim Lawton, one of my guys through the Samilkameen Valley, and uh, Joe Weaver, both in this, art, in this uh, uh, paper. So I don't know if there's other opportunities out there like this that you guys can find, but 
definitely solicit them and try to get involved in, the, in their publications. Just to give you another example, Joe Roberts, who was uh, the blogger of One Wine Dude, uh, became Playboy's online wine columnist for a few years. <laughs> Proof that some people did read the magazine. <laughs> <laughs> And then another guy from New York City, he was a sommelier, Levy Dalton. He's now a wine columnist for New York Eater, and he has this cult following that he never had when he was a sommelier. And uh, his, he's starting to branch out into all things around the city, so he's really had a lot of success with, with that. I know you guys have Eater Vancouver. Uh, I don't know if, is there a wine column for that out here? Anybody? There's no, lots yeah. of wine. There you go. There's my tip, practical tip for you guys. <laughs> um, I also suggest, and I'm sure you know this by now, always carry your camera. Except today when I didn't. Uh, you may decide to write about something later, and now you'll have those images. And I also look for topics that haven't been covered thoroughly. Everyone wants to write about Rome, but there are many experts in Rome already. So how many folks have covered the wine scene in Croatia, however? Alternatively, find a new angle like an up-and-coming neighborhood, an otherwise well-covered city. I also mentioned interviews earlier when I was talking about blogging. I think these are a great underutilized tool. Um, they're great for a column or a blog, and they're particularly useful for feeding the content beast. Sometimes you just can't generate your own content on a constant basis, but if you reach out to somebody to interview them, they're usually more than happy for the exposure, uh, and you also gain insights from an industry expert that you wouldn't have on your own. Plus, you'll learn something. Uh, it also draws on the fans of your subjects and brings their, brings their fans to your work. I find that 15 questions is usually plenty. Uh, several for background and for fact-finding, several to draw insights, and uh, that might otherwise be revealed, and then others you may ultimately edit out. But uh, usually 15 is a good start, and I bring it down to 8 or 10 for the actual article. If you cover your local or regional scene, you can interview the owner of a new establishment or an established business, or even a local like Joe Weeb from Vancouver Island. I also like to interview through email, especially for a blog. It makes it much easier to edit later. Uh, I've tried doing interviews in person with uh, my phone out and the app out, and it's like painful going through and listening to it and stopping it and listening to it and trying to do the dictation later. So. Uh, for a print article, obviously you want to capture the color of the personality of the person, so it's easier to meet them in person. But interviewing through email is a great way to get content and information without necessarily having to do extensive work on it. And, and one other tip is to set up the interviews. If you're going on a trip and you have, don't have anything planned in advance, really, or what, know what your angle is for it, it's nice to set up interviews along the way so you can get insider tips along the way. And that can always be converted into an article later. And it's also a great way to convince a tourism board it's worth sending you to a location, even if you don't have an advanced assignment, because you're going to be meeting with people and getting inf inside information while you're on the ground. So I was asked how I choose my subjects. Uh, that's a tough one, because I have an insatiable curiosity for the world. It makes it very difficult to narrow down what to talk about half the time. Uh, I'm limited in my time to travel, and then edit photos, and then actually write the article can't be in five places at once, although I wish I could. Uh, when it comes to my wine topics, in my early stages, uh, most of my topics honestly came from WSEC coursework. There's so many interesting varieties around the world I'd never heard of, that we tasted, that I wanted to learn more about, and when you should learn, you want to share. So a lot of that came from uh, just actually studying wine. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I tend to avoid obvious and well-covered topics, however. I'm not going to be an expert in Bordeaux because I can't afford most of those wines. <laughs> and I have not been contacted yet by any of the chateaus who send them to me. So, the same, I've, I've gotten a few Napa caps though, so. <laughs> but, um, so don't try and cover something that, you know, somebody's already a master at and has, you know, the budget for. Instead, I look for small producers doing something a little different from their neighbors, um, an overlooked region or a promising region for, for example, the Okanagan Valley and Vancouver Island. And being on the ground in and of itself is a way to get angles for stories. You know, it exposes you to new, new ideas that you wouldn't have known existed before being there in person. One of, the most, one of my most read posts, actually, was a trip I took to Santorini, Greece. 
in 2009. I actually wasn't really aware they had wine there. And uh, it turns out they have a really fantastic, very old wine culture on that island, which I discovered just driving around in our car. And so, uh, to my husband's happiness or chagrin, I'm not sure which, it became, instead of a relaxed vacation, a, a chasing of the vine, if you will, around the island in the few days we had left so we could hit as many wires as possible, sample them all, take photos. Um, I, when I got back, I actually posted a story about it on chasing the vine, and it turns out it was one of the most read posts I've ever published. People love Santorini, and oh. people are always searching for it, just in any capacity, it drives them to my website anyway, even if they weren't looking for a story on wine. So, uh, and interestingly enough, it drew attention from the Greek wine community, and I started receiving Greek wine samples after that. Mm. <laughs> it's always a bonus. <laughs> uh, other experiences I've had that led to stories where I was in Namibia, who would think that there was wine in Namibia? It's a dry desert African country in the southwest uh, of, the, of the continent. But once again, driving around, I, we noticed that there's a strong German culture there. And Germans have a tendency to bring vine cuttings from the homeland, wherever they go, and try to make grapes grow. So we ended up discovering this little vineyard in the middle of nowhere, struggling in the country. But they actually were growing some decent columbard, and they were pairing it with zebra charcuterie. Which was interesting. <laughs> so you'll see that's me laying on the ground over there taking photos. Uh, but the bottom, on, the bottle on the bottom right is a, a photo of the bottle. We were sitting out watching the sunset, drinking our our Namibian columbard, which is highly unique. Uh, another story I recently uncovered was about the beer scene in New Zealand. I went down there for wine, and I stayed for beer. I was sent by the New Zealand wine growers to cover the entire country's wine regions. I was from top to bottom for a month. And then I said, I'm going to change my ticket because there's some really cool beer in Wellington, guys. Uh, I still am writing stories on the wine scene, mind you. So, uh, But I was so enamored of the beer scene there. They have very interesting hops that are only grown in New Zealand because of the way the variety, or the strain rather, developed, and it can't be copied anywhere else in the world. So they have these, provide these really unique uh, aromas and uh, notes of Sauvignon Blanc, very similar to Sauvignon Blanc, gooseberry, passion fruit, some people call it sweaty armpit, depends on what, how your nose is calibrated, but, um, but yeah, I noticed that the New Zealand winemakers kept talking about beer the whole time, and so when I got up to Wellington, I found that, this fantastic, thriving craft scene, and spent a couple days there um, getting to know it. I was taken around by the local specialist who introduced me to everyone I needed to know, and all of a sudden I had three articles, which I pitched while I was there, and all three were sold. Mm. And then, just one more example of how you discover random things when you're on the road, uh, wine in China. You may have heard they have a growing industry, snake wine, plum wine. <laughs> Not, nothing I think is going to make it through the customs uh, <laughs> control, however. No, that's actually a joke. They do produce wine. I won't even put an adjective in there. But uh, that's me enjoying a bottle of it or drinking it. <laughs> it's a young wine culture. <laughs> you're, not, you're not mixing Coca-Cola? No, 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 no. I'm a purist. <laughs> Um, finally, another way I select subjects, to be honest, is with PR firms. As I mentioned earlier, the PR companies are, are, are big in New York and they constantly send you pitches. I generally won't use that pitch, but it will inspire other ideas. They also provide a lot of paid media and industry trips. So if you can get yourself on the list of PR folks, um, with PR folks, it's a great resource for learning about a region um, by going on their trips with them. And uh, you're never obligated to write about a specific wine or winery, you just learn about the region. And I've never been to a region in my life that didn't have something worthwhile to write about. So it, they also offer opportunities to profile high, uh, to interview high profile figures that you might not have access to. Um, for instance, I recently interviewed Angelo Gaja, who is the famed Barbaresco producer from Piedmont. He just uh, released his new Tuscan wines, so he brought them to New York City and was doing a release and inter being interviewed by journalists. I would never have had access to this guy, but for the PR company that opened that door for me. So PR can be your friend. Uh, I also, before trips, research the neighborhoods of my destination. 
um, for instance, Barrio Alto in Lisbon, or Palermo Hollywood in Buenos Aires are really up and coming areas. They have a lot of young people, artists, bar owners bringing fresh perspective. And when I'm down there, I'm on foot most of the time. I like to be biking more often, but uh, that usually doesn't happen. And scouring the streets for promising establishments, restaurants, wine bars, anything that looks interesting uh, is, 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 a, is fair game. Signposts I look for, new businesses which stand out from the rest, uh, restaurants with unusual wine lists, or uh, real attention to detail in their decor. Also, regional food specialties, uh, like Lima, Peru does superb ceviche, and Argentina has mastered the art of red meat consumption. But lesser known, actually, is that Argentina's ice cream rivals gelato, and mm -hmm. Italian gelato, because the Italian immigrants brought the techniques down to Argentina. So that's my hot tip for you guys. Someone should write that story. Argentinian ice cream. Uh, I also spend a lot of time talking to people in the food and wine industry on the ground. Uh, wine and food are natural companions, so if a restaurant has wine, they probably are a good source for recommending wineries, and wineries tend to know where the good food's at. So, um, I also want to touch upon wine versus coffee for a second. Um, I have a little chart I put up here that just... Uh, most people aren't aware of the similarities between wine and coffee, and I want to explain how I transitioned into writing about it. Um, even you know, people who are knowledgeable about wine have very little idea that wine and coffee have so much in common. Uh, I even interviewed a very high-profile wine writer, whose name I will not mention, who said the only way she takes her coffee is scalding hot. And that was it. Didn't care about the nuance of it, didn't care about anything else. So I thought, you know what, there's something to coffee, this should be explored. Uh, New York in the last five years in particular has been in the midst of a surge in coffee culture. We're experiencing a lot of it from abroad. Scandinavia has fantastic coffee. Australia, Melbourne in particular is a big coffee city, and Japan. Uh, and coffee's not covered in mainstream media very much. There's no coffee columnist for the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Uh, I decided to start this coffee and tea column in the voice so I could cover the growing scene. And this chart gives a quick glimpse into just some of the comparisons between the two. I'm sure you're familiar with several great varieties, Cabernet Sauvignon, Pinot Noir, Sauvignon Blanc. They're actually 1,400, well, according to one wine journalist. Um, but coffee also has many varieties, and they're known as cultivars. Some are called Bourbon and Geisha, which are on the bottom right there, you can see the words. There are actually thousands of cultivars in coffee, more than grapes. And coffee, like wine, can only be grown in certain regions and conditions which affects the flavor. So, for example, wine is generally grown between the 30th and 50th latitudes, and coffee needs tropical, high-altitude locations, reminiscent, reminiscent of terroir. You're probably aware there are hundreds of flavor compounds in wine, cherries, peaches, chocolates, and grass. However, there are even more in coffee as well, which includes cherries, peaches, chocolate, and grass. Uh, and coffee, like wine, when treated delicately and with respect, can produce a, a beverage of Im immense nuance. So it's obviously logical, at least to me, that one could write about the book. Um, moving on to getting published. The hardest part of writing, after the writing part, in my opinion, is getting published. And here are just some of my thoughts. I'm sure you all have a range of experiences, as I mentioned earlier, on this topic. So. I welcome any insights you guys have, um, but rather than the cold call approach, like emailing the at editorial.com for a website, which I've done and never ever once heard back from anybody, uh, I tracked down the name and email address of the editor or staff member. This may sound kind of obvious, but um, it's kind of hard to do that. So utilize your fellow writers as a resource. I'm very lucky in New York, and I don't know what it's like out here but writers are really happy to share contacts with one another. There's, it's a spirit of collaboration rather than competitiveness. I'm not sure why New York happens to be that way, as I said, I don't know where else, if it's like that elsewhere, but uh, I'm lucky in that regard. And then PR firms, they have all those contacts at those <laughs> magazines. Get friendly with them and ask them for their list. They will actually be happy to make introductions if you, if you made nice, played nice with them. Uh, also, LinkedIn groups, uh, I don't know who is been on the LinkedIn boards, which is the networking site, but I recently discovered in the last eight months that there are a lot of travel and wine groups on that board, uh, on that site. If 
you join them, I've also noticed editors coming in saying, hey, we are actually looking for pitches. They'll solicit group members for pitches on, on um, for their magazines. So that's one, uh, one outlet you can look at. Um, it's also possible if you're moving into online and don't have a lot of experience with it, to try starting with websites or publications that may not pay much, but will help build your resume and experience. And also consider contributing to industry blogs, such as Pallet Press. I write for them, it's a wine, it's a wine blog. Um, but they have the prestige of very esteemed uh, contributors, even though they don't pay much, but by being on it with those folks gives me credibility. Um, and press trips, I mentioned earlier, if you can get on them, they're a great way to network. There's obviously, a, there's, there are often a lot of editors on those trips, and each one I've been on, I've met at least one editor or contact that eventually led to a story. And just, you probably know pitching ideas and what you should do, but what I've found is I craft and edit pitches as carefully as I would final copy for publication. Uh, if you send things with errors, they don't like that. <laughs> And it doesn't look good. So I also found one or two good ideas are better than 10. Editors often complain they get too many ideas in one email or one document, and they are overwhelmed and they don't read it. Um, I also really closely scrutinize the content of the magazine in order to understand the audience and the tone that the editors are looking for. Um, you know, I've also heard editors complain that they get pitches that are totally off base from what their audience is looking for or what they are looking for. So you have to be very cognizant of that and also make sure you're not pitching topics that have been covered recently. That's also a pet peeve I hear a lot about. Um, and you already are learning and improving your photography, so that's uh, that's been covered, but it does make you more marketable nowadays if you can do all of your own photography. I've been paid for my photographs now, also in print and, in, uh, and for online work. So. And then I try pitching a couple times a week to stay in the habit. Also difficult to do, but it's uh, it's good. The, the only problem with pitching regularly is if you're in a position to not respond quickly. Editors seem to have a bad habit of saying, oh, I needed that five days ago. Thanks for the idea. Uh, obviously not true, since they never heard of it five days ago. But um, the turnaround time tends to be quick on things. So uh, I do try to pitch while I'm on the road as well. Uh, I recently was in Fiji and I pitched Sabur on a Fijian ceviche dish. It was based on fresh coconut milk and I've never seen anyone actually write about how it's made. So I have some photos from it up there. Um, I'd never known about the dish until going to Fiji and uh, at the same time while I was there I pitched Men's Journal on the more adventurous aspects of Fiji including shark diving. So you can see a couple photos from there. Uh, and I also wanted to touch upon the topic of writing and sending photos for free. Everybody wants something for free nowadays. And I don't know about you guys, but I've been solicited a number of times to contribute to stuff without payment. Uh, it's easy to be seduced by the, by the pitch to you that you'll get a lot of great exposure and it'll be worth your time and they'll give you a link to your blog. Um, particularly if you're transitioning from print to online, uh, it may be tempting particularly to donate photos for free. People want that all the time. Um, I'd ask, at fast I'd estimate that seven out of 10 times is not worth it. It's, obvious, it's usually a lot of uh, time consumption, uh, but things to consider what kind of audience you will reach, large, small, the kind of audience you're interested in and exposing your work to, what exposure to the audience you will receive, will you be positioned as an industry expert, will they reference your work, um, and it, is it worth building a relationship? In the long term, will you be, get paid opportunities after this, or is it just a one-off? One -off? Uh, to give an example of a, of a time when I thought it was worth doing, I accepted an offer recently to write a 700-word article for bar and restaurant magazine and provide photos. This magazine doesn't pay its contributors. It's a free online publication to foster community and education within the industry. Um, due to the reach and value of the audience, though, there, it's going out to restaurants around the country and to bar tenders and bar owners, I agreed to do it. An example of what I'll be doing is what's on the screen up here. Uh, this, this gentleman is named Michael Kaiser, and he's a beer authority. He uh, was, his website is Good Beer Hunting, and he just did the same thing that I'll be doing for the magazine. You can see on the bottom left, they gave him a pretty generous paragraph. Uh, 
devoted towards who he is, and they link to his blog. And on the right side, they actually devoted a whole page of the magazine to his blog, to his website. And then on the on the left there, you see that he gets a, a, his own photo. And on the right, uh, you can see that the layout of the magazine is pretty sophisticated, so it looks like something that you know, maybe will be worth my time. I'll let you know. Like, <laughs> if doing this for free turns out to be any, uh, worth my time, but that's, that's when it seemed like something that would be worth it. So. Um, just touch on use of social media. There are a lot of ways to connect to the online world out there, and I've been told I'm not do, using enough of them. My husband says I'm using too many, uh, <laughs> which is really only just two, but uh, I don't use Snapchat, Tinder, or Grindr. That's a joke. Anybody <laughs> knows what <laughs> You can look that up later. That's why I couldn't find you. <laughs> Um, I try to only select the tools that assist me without detracting from the immediate experience. I mean, if you're trying to send things out to like five different outlets, it gets tedious. Although there are ways through certain photography apps, as we saw earlier, that you can post to five or six different places. But, um, you know, Twitter, I'm sure most of you are familiar by now, or will be after this. Uh, it's great for an instant travel diary, posting photos, but it's really an attention drawing tool, I find. Whereas with Facebook, you can engage people more. Um, recently, I was heading down to Lima, Peru, and I compiled a list of 20 restaurants through my industry contacts on my Facebook page. And a lot of these restaurant con restaurant recommendations included insider access recommend uh, sorry insider access uh, <coughs> contacts at the restaurants stuff that I wouldn't have gotten through Twitter or any other way otherwise. So that ended up being a great resource for that. And briefly, since I know you guys have a tasting this afternoon, but it's a little bit later, I thought I would go over just a, just quickly how I write a tasting note. Um, my approach, I learned through the W set, and this is a level two, so it's a little uh, more basic than what I would write for an exam. But, uh, and I do write all my own food, food, tasting notes on wines, I just don't generally publish them, but, um, the WSET tasting process generally starts with analyzing the appearance, the aroma or nose of the wine, the palate and finish, and a conclusion on its quality. So with appearance, for instance, you can see the categories. You look if it's clear, um, is it clear or hazy? If it's hazy, it may, may uh, imply that there's a problem with the wine, it's faulty. You know, is the nose intense, some wine, uh, I'm sorry, there's a color intense, pale, medium, deep, and colors obviously can range from lemon gold and whites to garnets and rubies and reds. As far as the nose, you want to smell it, you're looking for faults. Uh, that comes from experience learning to smell faults, honestly. But uh, cork taint is probably the most, the one you'd be most familiar with and the most important, to, most likely that you'll find in your wine, although there's stuff like Britannomyces and things like that. Um, cork taint actually smells like uh, a wet newspaper or a musty basement. And it tastes like that too. So, uh, with, also with the nose, you want to note the intensity. Some grapes are more aromatic than others. For instance, if and if you're smelling a Nebbiolo, they're often quite aromatic and remind you of tar and roses and cherries. Um, moving on to the palate, you want to sense for sweetness first. Uh, that's usually felt at the very tip of your tongue, actually. So, if it's a dry wine, you won't get any sensation down there. If it's Sweet, that's all where it will be found, is at the very tip of your tongue. Um, uh, they can range from ripe, and wines can range from ripe. Well, actually, well, I'm going to make the point that sometimes there's a confusion between what's sweet and what's fruity. Uh, a wine can be dry, but be really ripe with fruit flavors, but it's not a sweet wine. Um, and you also often hear people ask for dry red wines. Well, 95% of the time they're going to be dry. Uh, sometimes there's a little bit of residual sugar left in it, but uh, like a Napa cabs tend to actually have a couple little grams. But for the most part, red wines are dry. What they're referring to is whether they want a more earthy style or a, a sweet, I'm sorry, a, a ripe, uh, fruity style in the reds. So uh, you also look for acidity, and that's felt on the sides of the tongue. If there's high acid, your mouth is watering. Also, tannins range from low, medium, high, and white wines usually don't have them. And the alcohol, uh, it's not on that one because this is a level two, but in our, my, my 
um, level, you have to gauge if the alcohol is medium or high. If it's too high, it'll generally feel hot or bitter in the back of the mouth, and you'll get, often get a warmth or a burning feeling. Um, if it's too low, it generally makes the wine taste weak, thin, or watery. And on the palate, you've got uh, also your flavor profiles. So you have fruits, flowers, spices, vegetables, that kind of thing. And then how's the finish? Is it short or long? Um, and then the conclusion. Do you like it is probably the most important conclusion. <laughs> if you're writing for somebody, you, <laughs> they might expect a little bit more analysis than that. Uh, which generally means are all the components in balance? Does the acid and the fruit and the tannin structure, do they all feel like they're in harmony on your mouth, in your mouth? If they do and they have, and the wine has a nice finish, then it generally can be considered a, a balanced wine. And just if you're interested in learning more without necessarily signing up for a class, there's a really fantastic book I'd like to tell you about. If I have nothing to do with it, I just read it and I still always reference it on occasion just when I need to go back to the basics. Um, it's called Essential Wine Tasting, and it's by Michael Schuster. So you can email me later if you didn't catch that or if you, if you uh, want to ask me about it. But uh, this book is fantastic. So um, Moving on, I think we're just a few minutes <laughs> trying to be wary of the time here. Um, just want to touch on travel gear real quick because as we all know, now that we're all photographers, writing our, shooting our own images, writing our own articles, Trying to carry around the gear is such a pain. Um, I have gone through so many different permutations of how to carry my stuff. It's ridiculous and it drives my husband crazy. He's like, you need another bag, really? Why didn't you sell the old one? Because um, I might need it again, who knows? <laughs> so nowadays I carry a backpack. It's a camera backpack at the bottom. There's a compartment with this, uh, several um, pockets and padded sections for the lenses. And it also has a laptop slip in the back and it carries a lot of stuff. I usually put some kind of overnight uh, clothes in the bag just in case the luggage gets lost as well, which can happen. Um, so the camera backpack is fantastic. And uh, I also carry a purse I wanted to show you. And there's a lot of ladies in this crowd today, so this, but they do make men's purses, by the way. Again, I have no affiliation with them. This is just my working purse. Can you hold it up? Um, I discovered this brand is called Kelly Moore, and she makes bags to look like purses. So it's nice enough to go out at night, and uh, if you're, even if you, if you carry your camera or you don't carry a camera, it's basically just my now go-to purse. But inside, you'll see that she has a slip-in camera. Oh, yes. So it's fantastic. You can fit in um, a very big DSLR, uh, a lens or two, and a flash. If you, if you uh, reduce your size to the Fuji, I'm sure you can fit in a lot more stuff than that. But anyway, the brand's Kelly Moore, but there are others out there. And I swear by getting that bag has changed my life and how I travel, and it's much easier um, getting on and off the planes with, the, with my camera bag. So as far as my equipment, I carry a Canon D70. It's a pretty new camera. Um, I usually travel with a wide-angle lens and a mid-range zoom. The wide-angle lens is for landscape photography and also interior shots and buildings. And uh, unless I'm going on a safari or something, I usually leave the long range stuff at home. Question of tripod or monopod or no pod uh, always plagues me. Monopods are lighter. They're good for dark shots or crowded events because they just have the one leg, but they require handling, obviously. So you can't step away and get a shot of yourself. If it's really a low light situation, you can still have shake. So I've tried carrying the tripod. Uh, I just did that in New Zealand. Nearly regretted it because of the weight, but if I hadn't brought it, I wouldn't have been able to get these shots at nearly, at absolute dusk, and the uh, colors that popped on that came out really lovely. And that was the one time I used it, actually. On the <laughs> 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 um, so that's about it. Uh, you know, that's my life as a travel writer. Uh, here's some of the downfalls of it. <laughs> You probably can relate to these things. Yeah. There's low pay, lots of rejection. Uh, I leave my husband behind all the time. And there's a lot of deadline stress. I'm constantly working on the road. In fact, on this trip, I've been working and a little bit stressed out leading up to this because I had two deadlines I had to meet back home. This was my calendar last year. You can see I was gone basically two weeks of every single month, except for December, which I spent with family, finally. Um, but is it worth it? I don't know. I I would say so. And these are this will look through the photos of my last year. So, 
Last May, I was, uh, last May I was in Spain for the Feria, which is a horse show down in Jerez. I actually had a, an article published in Wine Enthusiast from that trip, actually with these photos. Here's the Okanagan from last year, Bloggers Conference in June. Okay. That was um, in Portugal in July when we were touring the Alentejo in the south uh, through the wine country. I turned a wedding invitation to France into another opportunity for writing about wine and uh, went to Champagne and Provence later on in that trip. Uh, I spent September in, in wine country in the south in Victoria. The other Victoria. <laughs> yeah. And October was in the Northern Territory. I went to Uluru. We saw, you can actually see the baby kangaroo in the pocket there on the top right. And we can catch the little head sticking out. In November, I actually, this was the only non-wine trip I had, which is kind of a, a relief. I can drink rum instead of wine. So <laughs> that was in Belize. I was covering a property in, southern, in the southern half of the country. So um, that was a nice trip. And then home for a change. The benefit of being home is all those wine samples you gain uh, from traveling and get sent to your house while you're away. Finally get to get open with family around the holidays. So they're always happy when I'm visiting. <laughs> two cases of wine and inevitably half of it gets left behind. So uh, then off to New Zealand by January and down in central Otago for the Pinot Fest. Then I didn't come home. <laughs> I decided to change my ticket. I had to call my husband and say, uh, by the way, another eight days I'm headed off. But uh, that was in Fiji, actually one of the most spectacular sunsets I've ever seen. And then I was off to Seattle in March. And in April, I was in Argentina and Peru. That was a tango show in Buenos Aires. And that's ceviche from Peru, which was fabulous. And then that's actually a photo from Salta in the north. There was a lady mentioning earlier that she loves the northern region of Argentina. I was in Salta for the wine for Torrantes. So beautiful. The skies up there are gorgeous. So that was just an example of this growing storm. I just had the, that was a driver just off on the road checking his phone, of course. It happens to be in my photo, but uh, just so dramatic and beautiful up there. And we end with May in Vancouver and back to the Okanagan and that's my story. So, thank you.